Nehemiah chapter 3 and tonight verse number 29. We're nearing the end of our journey through the third chapter, the great third chapter of Nehemiah. Let me read to you verse 29 and you will immediately pick up on the next gate. You'll identify the next gate we're going to study. Uh, the chapter surveys the whole city of Jerusalem showing how the ten gates are involved in the reconstruction process. And of course, ten gates are of no value unless the walls connecting the gates are in place and in good repair. Verse 29. After them, work crew after work crew. After them, repaired Zadok. Z-A-D-O-K. A very prominent name in Jewish culture in history. After them, repaired Zadok, the son of Emmer. I-M-M-E-R. We're going to look at these names briefly. Over against his house. We have seen that again and again. Over against his house. He's building the wall in the area where we live. We discussed that in one of our recent classes. After him, the verse, though it's only one verse, has two sentences. After him repaired also Shemaiah. That's another Jewish name, Shemaiah. The son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the, here it comes, east gate. The keeper of the east gate. So now, as we circumnavigate the city of Jerusalem, we have come to the east gate. May I improvise that a little bit? The eastern gate of the city. Class, you're probably tiring of seeing the chart. We began back in verse 1 at the sheep gate. Look at the end of my finger. Worked our way around to the fish gate, the old gate, counterclockwise all the way. The horse gate, last lesson, and now the east gate. The east gate is near the temple. East gate, temple. East gate, temple. And, and uh, it is the main gate that enters into the temple area. Uh, let me say this. This is the ninth of the ten gates. We are one gate away from having studied each of those gates of ancient Jerusalem. And, and so uh, uh, that being said, oh, 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 I need to say this. I have preached the gates of Jerusalem in uh, where this is the church where I'm preaching revival this week. I, I thought the pulpit to be particularly beautiful. And uh, uh, it is a Bible believing uh, a church in the city of Kannapolis, North Carolina. Uh, I, I preached revival here years ago. They have completely remodeled, redone the church. It's a beautiful, beautiful location. I thought we'd have class here and uh, in years past, not recently, I have preached these gates of Jerusalem, all 10 of them, uh, either in one sermon, tends to be a long sermon, or in a week's revival meeting. That would be five sermons. That's two gates a sermon. That's more practical. But I did not realize as I preached them, I, I would just go this gate and the next gate and the next gate. I did not realize that some of the gates are separated by many verses in Nehemiah 3. And some of the gates uh, only encompass one verse. And so I'm learning that as we study together. And we're on one of those one verse gates again. There have been others as you know. So... Instead of going verse by verse concerning the east gate, we're going to get to go word by word concerning the east gate. And preacher, what's the advantage of that? You, you don't want to spend time on each word. Listen to me. The Bible is inspired. Will I hear an amen? Word for word for word. Listen to 
2 Peter 1, 21. We studied it recently. We went through every verse in 2 Peter. The prophecy, Peter writes, the Holy Ghost tells him to write. The prophecy, that means the Bible, the Word of God. The prophecy came not in old time. We're talking Old Testament now. By the will of man. Man didn't decide to write it. But holy men of God. The Bible's written by holy men of God. Written over a period of 1,600 years, thereabouts. Written by 40 different authors. Holy men of God. Both Old Testament and New spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Here they sit, pen and paper in hand, and the Holy Ghost moves them. Uh, that is a word that is used when the breeze blows the ship a little closer to the port. The Holy Spirit breathed on them, moved them, and they wrote word for word. Holy men of old, holy men of God spake. You don't speak paragraphs. You don't speak ideas. You don't speak theories. You speak words, nouns and verbs and pronouns and interjections and prepositions. They spake. We're going to get to look at it like God gave it word for word. We believe in the, let me introduce this term. We believe in the verbal inspiration of the Bible. What does that mean, preacher? Verbum, V-E-R-B-U-M in Latin means word. We believe the Bible is inspired, not just chapter by chapter, word by word by word. It is also called the plenary inspiration of the Bible. That's a Latin word too. Plenus, P-L-E-N-U-S, and it means complete. That means we believe the Bible is inspired in its complete form. I need an amen. From Revelation, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, it is whole. There's not a book in there that is not breathed, inspired, and inerrant, written by Almighty God. So, let's study our text word for word. If we're going to do that, we better get started, then. After them repaired Zadok, the son of Emmer. Even that little, that little temporal marker, after them. Akhar. It is spelled A-C-H-A-R. Uh, it is an adverb, and it means one of two things. It can mean either. We'll have to go by the context here. It can mean uh, after these things. It can mean after in place. This group repaired that section of the wall after in place. And next to them, the next group repaired. After in place. And next to them, the next group. After in place. Going around the city. It can also mean, and I wrote it down, it can mean after in the sense of time. Afterwards in time. It could mean this section of the wall got completed and we say, well, this is no good. This next section and another crew moves in to work on that side afterward in the sense of time. Either way, any way you want to look at it, a careful record is made of the rebuilding of the walls of the city of Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the gates of the city of Jerusalem. A careful record. May I suggest very quickly, God is making a careful record of what I do and God's making a careful record of what you do in his vineyard, in his field of labor uh, as we go fishing for men, as we go plowing with the gospel plow. You say, what do you mean, preacher? You're going to get tired of this verse. Of course, we'll soon be out of chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. I'm just going to give you part of the verse. God is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love. God will remember everything you've done for him out of love, out of sincerity. He will not forget. Matthew 10, 42. Whosoever shall give to drink one of these little ones a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, in Jesus' name, he will in no wise Lose his rent. God will reward our labor even as small as a cup of cold water. Listen to Matthew 10, 41. He that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. You help a prophet serve God, God will reward you. He knows you've helped that prophet. Hey, prophets 
reward. My, my, uh, uh, everybody that prays for Brother Bagwell in, in our ministry, uh, you're praying for us, every soul saved, every Christian encouraged. I would not be surprised at the judgment seat. You will be rewarded for your prayers, for your help as we serve the Lord Jesus Christ after them. Let's go to the next word that, uh, oh, after them, and then after them, and after them, there, here's the total. At least 43 work crews are named individuals. Sometimes a man's working alone. At least 43 work crews are named individuals after them, after him, uh, next to him. My, what teamwork is involved here. Uh, let's say, after them repaired. After them repaired. Now, that's our old friend, Chazak. It is spelled C-H-A-Z-A-Q. Chazak. And, and what does it mean, preacher? Just exactly to repair, to rebuild. It implies there might have been a little bit of the foundation there, but it has to be built upon. It has to be put back into working order, repaired. Get this. I counted them up on my laptop this morning before I came over in the motel room, before I came over to record. 35 times in Nehemiah chapter 3 alone. Huzzah, huzzah, they repaired, they repaired. There's a whole lot of repairing going on. The sister verb to hazak, to repair, is the verb bana, B-A-N-A-H. We'll notice it uh, or are cognate of it in a few minutes. And that means absolutely to build. That implies you're starting from scratch all the way from the foundation. And 11 times in Nehemiah 3, bana is used. Whatever stage of ruin, whatever stage of decay, whatever stage... Of disrepair is found. Somebody's going to do the job. Somebody's going to labor to put things back. Glory to God to put things back in working order. Uh, and uh, let me give you an example of uh, degrees of badness, degrees of disrepair. Revelation chapter 3. God's writing to the church at Sardis. Jesus, it's his epistle to the church at Sardis. These things saith he, it's Jesus that hath the seven spirits of God. Jesus, the Holy Ghost, uh, God the Father, that's the Godhead. Uh, I know thy works, Sardis. You've got a name that you're alive. Uh, they, you, you've got your name on the sign out in front of the church, but thou art dead. You've got a name that you live, but you're dead. Wow, well, that's bad shape. That needs banal. That's got to be totally right. Only God. I don't take a miracle. But then... The next verse, the Lord says, Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. Strengthen them. Some things are already dead. They'll have to be rebuilt. Some things are still alive, but they're going to die if they don't get here and they need to be strengthened. They need to be revived. That's the whole principle, Bible principle of revival. And uh, How about you in reading your Bible? Is it dead or does it need simply to be? Revived. How about your prayer life? Is it about dead? Or, or does it need some uh, breathing of the Holy Ghost on it to be rebuilt? Bana or Hazak? Which one do you need? God give us wisdom to discern that very idea. Again, that's the principle of revival. All right? After them repaired Zadok, the son of Emmer. Zadok, the son of Emmer. Let's think about this individual. Very common name, as I said, in Jewish history, culture, society. And the name Zadok means righteous or righteousness. And uh, all right, preacher, can you explain that a little further? That is the word for the righteousness of an almighty God that he applies to my heart that is available to me through the blood of Jesus shed on the old rugged cross. This boy is, is named Zadok, righteous. It, it's like, it, it's like uh, his name implies he's going to be a good boy. 
He's going to be a godly boy. He's going to be a born again boy. I'll put New Testament language into this Old Testament. He's going to be a righteous boy uh, through the grace of an almighty after them repaired Zadok. And I'll tell you who's going to be the builders at church. It's the godly folks. It's the folks who are serious about serving the Lord. After them repaired Zadok, the son of Emmer. Zadok, the son of Emmer. By the way, when it comes to righteousness, let me say this. There are only two kinds recognized in the Bible. Man's righteousness, that's no good. And God's righteousness, that will get you to heaven. Isaiah 64, verse 6, I believe it is. Our righteousness, man's righteousness in God's eyes is as filthy rags. Did you hear that? As filthy rags. That's, that's a very graphic term. But if I can lay aside my righteousness, admit I'm a sinner, tell God I'm spiritually bankrupt, nothing in my hand I bring, only to thy cross I claim. If I can do that, I can experience by grace through faith in the shed blood of Jesus, God's righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verse 21. God took my filth, he took my ugly, dirty rags, and he gave me the righteousness of Jesus because of what Jesus accomplished on Calvary. Again, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 21. Only two kinds of righteousness. He is the son of. You're going to even talk about that. Yeah, Emmer, uh, uh, Zadok, who is the son of Emmer. The son of. Let me give you that little noun real quick. It is spelled B-E-N in Hebrew. Ben. Ben. He is the son of. Daughter is similar, except it's got a feminine ending. It's not just the masculine B-E-N, Ben. What does it mean? The word for son, B-E-N, springs from the verb, we've already discussed it a little bit, bana, B-A-N-A-H, get it? Bana, to build. Ben, a son. Get this, please. In Bible terminology, in Hebrew analogy as well, a man is building his family, building his house, building his name, building his heritage, uh, building his, his love for God when he has a bana building ben, a son or a daughter. But here the word is son. Uh, three sons, you're on your way to building a godly generation. Book of Malachi says we, as parents, we want to raise up godly seed, godly children for our heavenly Father. Say so children that will outlive us and keep serving Jesus, keep witnessing for the Lord Jesus, the Son of. And 37 times in chapter 3, we come across that little word, Ben. The son of, the son of. This is a family affair. This is a family building project. And you know what? We're in the family of God. I'm looking out at dozens of pews. There'll be uh, people in those pews tonight in the service. The family of God. Bana, building for the glory of God. Ben, the sons and daughters of Almighty God. The son of Emmer. Are you following it in, in our verse? After them repaired Zadok, the son of Emmer. Now what does the name Emmer mean? Here, I think it gets interesting, extremely interesting. Emmer is a, it comes from Amar, A-M-A-R, a basic Hebrew verb, and it means to speak or to say. It can be translated, he hath said. He hath said. And in scripture, if you go to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, he hath said, God has said something. Could I get an amen? God has said something. What has God said? For the word of God, God has said, is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2. Hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. This emmer, it implies speaking the word of God, teaching the things of God in your home. Proverbs 1, 8, a godly daddy says, my son, hear the instruction of thy father. He hath said in the law of thy mother. Uh, wait a minute. Am I seeing a linkage here? The daddy whose name means he hath said. The daddy whose name means God hath said. 
Uh, the, his name means the word hath said. He raises a boy whose name is Zadok Righteousness. Yeah, there's a spiritual principle there. If I'll give my children the word of God, if I'll teach my children the word of God, if we'll inculcate into them, if we'll drill and teach into them the precious truths of that book, it won't be long they'll get S-A-V-E-D saved. It won't be long they'll, get, they'll become righteous in the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of an almighty God, Zadok, the son of Emmer. May I say hallelujah. Let's continue with our verse. After them repaired Zadok, the son of Emmer, over against his house. Over against his house. Preacher, can you explain that over again? I did last lesson. You need to keep current on the lessons. I can't review. It, it is the word N-E-G-E-D, neged. N-E-G-E-D. And what does it mean? Over against, but uh, more uh, critically, face to face. More critically yet, in your face. Remember, we talked about the Bible word help meet. The concordances will only give you the word help. He's there. Cheerleader. Come running to be of assistance. Uh, uh, uplifting every way you can. But the word meet, that's neither. N-E-Z-E-R. I'm, I'm sorry. Neged. N-E-G-E-D. Let me respell that because I misspoke. N-E-G-E-D. And it means in your face. Remember, we said a good wife will encourage you, love you, be a cheerleader. But if she sees you're doing wrong, if she feels in her heart something, she'll get in your face. She'll say, honey, your decision will prevail, but I'm warning you. I'm telling you, I don't feel right. But thank God for our good help. It's over against his house. Over against his house. And, and uh, the word house, basically, B-E-T-H, Beth in Hebrew. That is not only the word house. That is a letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Now watch because I'm going to use my chart. I'm going to draw just briefly. I'm going, well, I won't be doing it with that pen because that pen's dried up. I'm sorry. Uh, give me just a second. Yeah, this will work. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. That is the letter bet. In Hebrew, B-E-T-H. I'm going to extend this front a little bit. That is the letter. And what does it mean? House. Preacher, I don't. Every Hebrew letter is also a word picture. How's that a house? A man can go into his house. You see, I've grown that. And there he'll find safety. There he'll find protection. There he'll find love. There he'll find security. Uh, there he'll find a peace of mind. And uh, that's the word house. Do you know what our house is supposed to be? What our homes are supposed to be? They're supposed to be places of refuge. Not places where we fuss and we fight. Places secure where we can gather our children around at breakfast or supper and teach them the word of God. He's building over against his house. Every one of us men ought to stop and take an event. Is my house in order? Is my house right? That's what uh, we need to do. That's the spirit of revival again. After him, after same words as before. After him, repaired. Same word as before. After him, repaired. I, I, I just can't go into after him. It implies teamwork. There is teamwork involved. Repair, uh, that's hazak again. And uh, it, it means to do the repairs that are necessary. When they built the temple, Solomon's temple, not one sound was heard. Uh, they cut the rock, they quarried the rock, they shaped the rock, knocked the oh, down at the rock quarry. And at the temple site, not a sound. Perfect quiet as things were assembled together. You say, prove that. First Kings chapter 6 and verse number 7. But, but when they're building this wall, you can be sure there's some hammers knocking against the wood. Nails being uh, driven into the timber. You can be sure there's a sound of a handsaw working over there. There's a lot. There's teamwork going on. Now, after him repaired Shemaiah. Shemaiah, let me give you this one real quick. What does Shemaiah mean? Shemaiah means this. Shema and then Yah. Shema and Yah. That's the Hebrew constituents of the word. And it means Jehovah 
has heard. Or it means Jehovah hears me. It's the idea I can pray. God hears me. I'm heard by God. What a God we have. He's got an ear to listen to meet our need. That's what Shemaiah means. And Shemaiah is the son, that's B-E-N again, is the son of Shechaniah. Shechaniah. And what does Shechaniah mean? Let me tell you very quickly. Shechaniah means God dwells here. Shechaniah, that's Shekhan. That is Shekhan in the word Shekinah. The Shekinah glory of God is the glory of God that settled on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies, in the, t- in the tabernacle, in the temple. Of, uh, and uh, uh, Shekhaniah means God lives here. Look at here. A daddy whose name means God lives here. He's a righteous man. He's a holy man. He's a pure man. And he bears a son, Shemaiah. God hears me. God answers my You're more likely to raise a praising boy, a praying boy. You're more likely to raise a boy in relationship with God if you've lived a life where God lives in your home. God dwells in your innermost man. These names show linkage, the right father, and he's raised the right kind of son. Hallelujah. Shemaiah, God hears. Shechaniah, God dwells within me. The right kind of daddy and my a godly godly son but we learn one more thing he is the keeper uh, Shemaiah the son of Shechaniah the keeper of the east gate and, and the word there for keeper oh I'm going to have to hurry uh, the word there for keeper is Shamar it means to guard it means to watch over uh, this is the only time it's used in chapter number 3 and, and it's the idea of keeping an eye on the gate protecting the gate to the glory of an almighty God and it ties into the meaning it ties into the meaning of the eastern gate what does the eastern gate mean By the way, the eastern gate that enters into the temple area is often at times called the golden gate. The golden gate. And its spiritual emphasis, there's no doubt about this, it represents the second coming of our Lord and Savior, eastern gate, the second coming. Listen to Jesus in Matthew 24 and 27. For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines to the west, the lightning comes out of the east, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. That verse says Jesus is coming out of the east. In the book of Ezekiel, it's in chapter 10, chapter 11, Israel is sin, Judah is sin, God's glory is lifting off the temple and is departing from the temple and God's glory leaves at the eastern gate. Ezekiel 10, 18 and 19. Ezekiel 11, verse number 23. God's glory left from the eastern gate. But guess what? In Ezekiel 43... There is repentance. God's glory comes back and God's glory enters back in the eastern gate. Ezekiel 43, verse 1 and verse number 2. Oh my, Uh, Jesus has left. Jesus ascended from, but he's coming back again. He's going to return out of the east and and he's going to return to the city of Jerusalem. And it is well, but today the eastern gate is blocked up, bricked up. Big stones have blocked it, but oh my, one of these days, and uh, and one of these days when Jesus came, I fully believe he, when he rode that little donkey into Jerusalem, we believe he rode through the eastern gate. I believe when he comes back, he'll march into Jerusalem riding that white horse on through that eastern gate. It'll be broken up. It'll be opened up. Glory to God. Uh, uh, the word there for gate shut. Uh, Sha'al, it, it, it means to split open. The root he, 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 that gate's going to split open. Those blocks, are, and Jesus is coming into the city. Two times in Revelation, Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. 22 12. In 22 20, he that testifies these things says, Surely I come quickly. I come quickly. 
all that I'm trying to say that Eastern gate. And why does there have to be a keeper uh, of the Eastern gate? We got to be aware he's coming. We can't let it slip our minds that Jesus is coming. Watch for you know not the day or the hour. Be alert. Be awake. Matthew 25. Jesus is coming again. Uh, uh, look up. Lift up your heads. Your redemption draweth nigh. Man, uh, 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 the scripture says Luke 21 and 28. Eastern gate. Jesus is coming again. Are you ready for the return of our Lord? And listen to this. 1 John 2, 28. Now little children abide in Jesus. So when he will appear, we'll have confidence and not be ashamed. Not be ashamed.